My 30-year-old wife and I recently married. We dated for six years, including a three-year engagement during which COVID-19 postponed our wedding twice. My wife has struggled with depression, ADHD, and anxiety. During our relationship, her mental health concerns have worsened, especially because to the COVID-19 pandemic. Being away from others during the pandemic and a family health issue caused her anxiety. In this time, she lost her job but swiftly found a remote, irregular hours job. I've always tried to be supportive, and she's claimed I'm the only person that convinced her she could be who she wants to be. That probably stopped being true. She acquired COVID a few months after our wedding and experienced long-term effects. It was intellectually and physically challenging. She seemed to have recovered after a few months when she developed COVID again and extended symptoms. We managed it better, so it improved faster, but the stress was too much. We began masking more carefully after her second COVID-19 infection. We only ate indoors on special occasions and wore masks in bars. Wintertime outdoor seating was used at any available location. Her second COVID recovery led to worse despair than I had observed before. She took leave from job. I fed her, handled all the chores, and worked full-time during her melancholy episode and leave. Improvement began during her departure. She tried classes, but only yoga was consistent. Due to depression, her sleep routine was unpredictable, so she would often struggle to fall asleep, stay up late, nap, and repeat the cycle. She could take yoga lessons after dinner and have energy. She might pretend she was going to a bar with classmates or doodle there, or she should consider therapy, etc. She usually said she would go to the pub for an hour or two and then go home. However, she would repeat, just another two hours while I think about things, until bars closed. Sometimes inebriated, she returned home. During recovery from a depressive episode and extended COVID, I thought this was poor coping and caused her sleep worse. Sleep quality is vital for mental health, and she'd sleep all day without vitamin D. I'd comment, but she's constantly defensive of my advice. I journaled about this several times and asked her to talk to her therapist about it, but our couple's therapy sessions never addressed her communication concerns. We simply spoke about how to de-escalate and how to avoid triggering her from past trauma, extremely important. I believe this time was too much. Guys talked to her in time out. One wore her down and she made out with him. She gave him her alternate email and agreed to make out and have sex. She also met two more persons who she said she desired physical sex with, but she never had sex with them. She sent dirty SMS and masturbated to their texts. When I charged her phone while she slept, I realized this. We share face ID and fingerprint, and charging illuminates past notifications. I checked her phone after seeing a strange text. I didn't suspect anything when I clicked on it until I read what I was reading. It intrigued me because we were so open otherwise. Although I was upset, I observed that he sent emails to her alternate email, which she rarely checks. I sent myself the emails to prevent denials. After her snooze, we spoke and sobbed. I felt broken and numb. Despite her utter remorse, she said she was longing to be wanted and youthful and alive. She said she never wanted another. She admitted to mental problems and apologized for ruining our marriage. I told her I wanted to be with her to work on this, her mental health, and us. The next day was terrible, but we survived. She then saw a therapist. We discussed it later. She thought her therapist said, She's never done this, thus it's not who she is. She felt caged and needed care. True, her mental health benefits from time off. The manner I found out violated privacy. She said all this defensively and blamed me for her behavior. The perceived guiltlessness bothered me. She took responsibilities over the next few days, giving me hope for our growth. After afternoon yoga, she wanted to consider her career. Five days after learning. After she delayed returning home. Once again. I told her to take her time until she said she'd be home by two. I told she can't cheat again so soon. She expects my trust. How? She shared her phone location, so I went to her bar. I told her again in person. She stayed until two, as promised. She came home after I left. I doubt she cheated. The day after couples therapy, she saw another therapist a few hours later. After that, she's rarely home. She has mentioned dinner with a friend, but nothing more. Needs space, she says. She comes home late, sleeps on the couch until I wake up, then in our bed till we depart. Based on our couple's therapy session, she may expect changes from me to feel free. She shouldn't feel confined. 
She should be healthy, have good coping skills, and desire to be with me. She messages me, I love you, but hasn't said it in a week. Her desire to split further scares me. For my sake and hers, she had suicide thoughts, and I want her to be okay. I suppose she's put her parents' relationship onto me and will find anything I do dictatorial or annoying. Her therapist may have heard her talk about me this way and is urging separation. Based on what she's heard, I don't think her therapist is wrong, but my wife may be selective about what she tells her. For two months, she didn't inform the therapist she was cheating on me. She probably wasn't telling the therapist how often she drank alone. If she leaves at our next couple's therapy appointment, I'll be controlling her again. How did this happen? The couple's therapist informed me, just because she feels trapped does not mean that you are trapping her. I'm afraid my wife, who's felt I talk over her, is putting her foot in the sand. It feels unjust, but I don't want to lose her and start over. I also don't want to agree and make her think I want to control her. She would grow to resent me. For a reason, we had couples therapy before this happened. Because of past trauma, she gets triggered by my arguments. We've worked hard and I'm improving, but not flawless. And I believed she knew I wanted her to be happy and healthy first. How could she assume I want to dominate her instead of thinking she's coping poorly? I don't know how I wrote this, but I'm numb. I can't stress enough that I strive to comprehend in every interaction, even if she thinks I'm trying to win or if my tone ignites her trauma. It's the main thing we've discussed, and it hurts so much that she believes I want to control her, even though all I'm asking is that she be home by midnight on weekdays and sleep well for her mental health. Update. I'll update and address some popular feedback. After seeing the couple's therapist again, he and my therapist believed my wife had bipolar disorder, one or two, induced by lengthy COVID. Family members suspected it too. Several times in the last two weeks, she's came back to me crying, apologizing, and insisting she just wants me. We'll discuss our future and whether we need a move or reset. Making up includes sex. This absolution calmed her, but she got agitated again and left for longer periods, again with risky activities. She admits to cheating throughout these occasions. She's returned from somewhere at 6 a.m. and slept for 14, 15, or 19 hours, which worries me. Bipolar behavior seems stereotypical. After talking to my therapist, I realize this won't work out. I love this person and want the best for her, but I may not be helping. Not because I'm not trying, but because she must change internally. Bipolar takes a long time to treat, and even if it's treated well, we'll go back to a relationship in which she was so insecure about her worth, intelligence, and confrontation that it's hard to think we'll make it. My personal decision is to seek legal separation, divorce with split finances, but she can keep on my health insurance. My therapist says I have some control patterns to reduce anxiety, so some uncertainty will be excellent to learn to live with. I think it'll benefit my mental health, wife, and future. I'll arrange everything and ask for separation when my wife is steady. She packed her belongings to move out anyway, so it should be easy. I will go solo and ask buddies to join me on another trip. I've been reconnecting with many old friends and rebuilding my old community, and it's sad that I lost touch with so many excellent people, but pleased that I can now reconnect with them. The next tale. I sat at my desk thinking about our honeymoon in Hawaii with Maggie 30 years ago and my best memories. My heart is full of nostalgia and gratitude. I will always remember this magical time. From the start, we felt like we'd entered a mystical universe that banished all worldly worries and brought exquisite peace. The beauty of Waikiki's unspoiled beaches and soothing surf captivated us as we walked hand in hand. Primary aroma. Maria continually radiated love and peace. Our honeymoon was memorable for the gorgeous scenery and the adventures we enjoyed that shaped us. Exploring deep rainforests and hidden waterfalls revealed nature's beauty. We marveled at the force and beauty around us. Each sunset from our Maui cliffside villa painted the sky in spectacular colors. We were filled with love and devotion when we hugged. The nights were romantic, starting with a candlelit meal on the beach under the stars with fresh seafood and local sweets. Maggie's warm look made these evenings unforgettable. Hawaii went beyond a tourist destination. The culmination of our love story was constructed for us with loving memories and shared aspirations. I love our honeymoon and our deep connection. Hawaii fueled our love and gave us unequaled happiness and peace. I cherish these recollections in this romantic haven. 
While thinking about this thirty years later, my assistant entered my office and saw me staring out the window. Paused, then asked Jason, To whom do we owe your recent joy? Did you win the lottery? Would you share? That moment made me realize I had been happy and smiling for two weeks. I said my wife had been considerate and loving lately, making me feel valued and loved for the first time in years. I said it felt like a second honeymoon, ready to spend more time with her after two weeks of thinking about her. I called Maggie frequently to express my love and need. Despite acting like a love-struck teen, I didn't mind. I was happy again and wanted it to last. Maggie and I bond well. Some 30-year relationships lose their spark and become regular. Over the past two weeks, Maggie became frisky, demanding intercourse nearly every evening and surprising me like she hadn't in years. I always believed this change in her regard was a marital renewal. I left work early, beaming to surprise her with a romantic evening. I stopped at the liquor store to buy her favorite wine and a large box of chocolate-covered cherries after buying two dozen roses from the florist and penning a touching note on the card. Tonight, I plan to tell Maggie how much I love her and how much she makes my life happy, as well as surprise her with a seven-night cruise to commemorate our relationship. I entered our home via the garage and climbed the kitchen steps instead of being met by Maggie, my darling wife. I was beaming and jumping. We found our 29-year-old daughter Brandy at the kitchen table. I smiled, kissed her forehead, and said hello. Hi, sweetheart, your mom where? Two weeks previously, she and her mother had a meaningful talk. Brandy, I'm unsure. I love your father and worry this may hurt him. Dad loves you too, and he'll understand. It sounds like you met something new. Dad, who isn't getting younger, will understand your wishes and provide you this unique joy. Brandy comforted her. I can't tell your father I'm courting another man. I lack bravery, he said. Then let me handle it. Alexander will meet you at the diner at seven and you'll leave by six. I'll explain everything when Dad returns. And your dream adventure will come true, Brandy proposed. Yes, I agreed to this outing but have misgivings. This feels wrong. I shouldn't continue. How can I face your father in the eyes for two weeks knowing I've promised to meet another man? She pondered. Brandy suggested not telling him anything for a few weeks. Show him your affection. After I explain, he'll understand that this venture is about making new friends and having fun, not romance. Share your passion and change his world. After I explain things that night, he'll embrace you, understanding. Dad loves you and will do anything for you. He always shows affection by fulfilling your wishes. Maybe you're right. One outing is all it is. No, I'm not leaving your father for another. A night of fun after 30 should be safe. I'll remind your dad of his value and my love every day until the date. I'll try to make him happier than ever when I return. Make him feel loved and valued. This amazing man will provide you this unique opportunity. I must return to cook Mike's dinner. Thank you, sweetie, I greet Mike. When will you give us grandchildren? Soon. Brandy said they've started planning to try in a few months. Maggie stared at Jason's latest creation in her art studio behind their home before departing. She struggled with creativity lately due to guilt over thinking about another man. However, remembering Brandy's encouragement, her brushes danced across the canvas, painting beautiful, emotional pictures. She felt confident this path was correct for her, believing her spouse would support her alone. Her thoughts gave her serenity and relieved her guilt. Jason may be furious at first, but I'm sure I can prove my love. His marriage and parenting have been wonderful and I cherish him. I want to be the perfect wife and show my love for him. On my first night of showering him with love, I wore his favorite baby doll, my gown, hairstyle, and makeup. After greeting Jason at the door in my nightgown and heels, I escorted him to the bedroom. I removed his belt and pants. My first intimate act in years stunned him. His enthusiastic performance made me question why I hadn't done this sooner. He hugged me and smiled, saying this was the best homecoming ever. What started this? He asked. I loved you and wanted to make you feel respected. Did you like it? I did. It's been long. I'd forgotten how much I missed it, he said. I enjoyed luring him to bed. The most fulfilling, intimate experience in years followed our passionate kiss. In the ensuing two weeks, I reconsidered my scheduled outing with Alexander. Our intimate life became more thrilling, and Jason became more happy, witty, and affectionate. 
happier than ever. I reconsidered my date-night arrangements and told Brandy about the favorable developments, saying I might not do it anymore. Mom, oh great, avoid snap judgments. See how the following two weeks go. Spend time together and decide. Leaving alternatives open till the last minute is fine. She said Alexander will understand if you cancel. Perhaps you're right. Can you recall Alexander? I asked, knowing he was her friend's father. Absolutely. Mom. He spent every moment with his wife Mary after learning of her terminal illness. After his soulmate died, he rarely left home or saw friends or family. He spent years alone and silent without her. He felt disconnected when Mary and I suggested he socialize and date again. She said he was unsure how to connect with anyone other than his late wife. Hearing about this great man made me cry, and I realized we could help each other. I told him about your 30-year love for Dad and your devotion as a wife. I mentioned our romantic life stagnation and Dad's aging vitality. We considered a date to rejuvenate, not for romance, but for companionship without abandoning Dad. After seeing your photo, he smiled and asked if you'd want to meet him. I'm sure Mom will love your photo and tail, Mr. Connor. She's older than you, a few years. Will that cause issues? No, if she looks same. Absolutely not. I want to see her. What about your dad? Will he let her date me? This is his wife. Let me handle it. Dad will do anything to make Mom happy because she needs it as much as you do. You two can be wonderful friends and encourage one other. Let me organize everything. We'll talk to her. If she agrees, I'll give you her number. Arrange a date and spend the evening. Evenings. You mean what, Mr. Connor? You two are grown-ups. Both have needs. Plan an evening and night together creatively. You're gorgeous. Therefore, he wants to spend the night with you. If interested, I'll give him your number. Ask him to call you daytime. He looks great. Ten years younger than you. I know you'll like it. He needs company. And a pal. Surely you can give each other that. Alexander called Maggie the next day and invited her to stay with him for the night after a good talk. When he said how beautiful she looked in the photo and how nice it would be to date her, she felt like a schoolgirl excited to do something unusual. His flirtation made her queasy. She accepted the date and expressed excitement to meet him. She declined his pickup and instead to meet him at the restaurant. They texted every day, getting flirtier as the date approached. By their date night, Maggie's texts were anything but faithful. She was always excited about the future. She focused on Jason every night and poured more emotion into their love. Jason strolled around beaming and Maggie had a sudden passion she loved beyond her wildest expectations. I loved my kid and thought she was the most beautiful. Her transformation into a woman made me proud. I wish I had spent more time with her as she grew up, but I tried to give her a nice childhood and be there for her. I smiled at her but was confused. What are you doing here, darling? Your mother where? I requested. She saw me arrange two dozen roses, a bottle of wine, and a box of chocolates. Tonight I'll surprise your mom and can't wait to see her. I took travel documents and seven-day cruise tickets from my jacket. I'm bringing your mom on a seven-day cruise on Love, the new yacht, and I'm excited to watch her reaction. Don't tell her when she gets home. I want a surprise. Daddy usually smiled when she called me, remembering how she sat on my lap as a child, but I sensed something was wrong. She was crying and breathless, worried about what I was going to hear. Dad, we must talk. A layer fell off her cheek. She saw my worry. What's wrong? Does Mom have a problem? No, Mom is okay. Sit down and I'll explain everything. As she tried, I sat up and watched her tearful eyes. After a moment, she said, Dad, you know Mom loves you. She told me how well you two are doing. Yes, I love her too. That's why I want to show her my love. After seeing her emotions, I realized she was not getting her message across. Daddy, I'm sorry. The mummy has a date. I listened quietly but didn't understand. My mind interpreted her cries as frustration. Discussing what, Brandy? Your mother where? She recoiled at my loud demand. Daddy, mommy loves you. This could be misinterpreted. Mommy went on a date with another man and won't return till tomorrow. She couldn't tell you. She couldn't stand to hurt you, so I told you. Mom will return tomorrow after one night. Is this joke? Earnestness is impossible. Your mother would never betray me. She was loving and we connected. Dad, this is unacceptable. Loves you. She only needed to act. She was restless after 30 years of marriage and wanted more. She will love you more for giving her this experience, but nothing else will change. 
I examine Brandy, my daughter. Why are you involved? Your mother should not have accused you. I should talk to her, not you. How did she get you involved? Dad, Mom and I have always been close and share everything. She told me that you two had stagnated in the bedroom and that she craved excitement. The father of my acquaintance lost his wife years ago. He was devastated and wanted company, so I introduced them. My sudden rise tipped the chair behind me. What are you joking about? Did you introduce them and arrange for your mother to date another man? Are you implying that? Her days become quiet. Now I was pacing the kitchen trying to understand this disaster. Damn it, Brandy! Reply. I yell, overshadowing her. You plan this? My wife! Your mother dates your friend's father. You placed it at these vehement words, I spat. Daddy, I'm sorry. It sounds dreadful when said that way. I loved my friend's parents, so I did it. Goodness, what did you do? Love for your friend's parents. How about your love for me? Am I just an item you may ignore and expect me to accept whatever you think? Now where's she? What did you mean by she wouldn't return till tomorrow? Dad led her to a restaurant. Not sure which one. They'll then spend the night together, this time only. She'll return tomorrow. And Dad? Her affection is for you alone. Her only message to me in the previous two weeks has been that she loves you and doesn't want you to hurt. Just a date. One night, she believed you would understand and grant her this one opportunity. Is that all I should believe? Like a fool, she claimed her recent advances in the last two weeks were romantic, but now you're telling me she used it to relieve guilt. I guarantee this will not be beneficial. Still crying, she begged. Nothing like that, Dad. She never let you down. She did everything she could to show you she loved you. Dad, can't you let her stay one night? You know she loves and needs you. She said she was excited to spend time with my grandkids after retirement. Mike and I are considering having children and need you both. Isn't it unusual that she chose a man other than me? This person is who? Mary's dad, my friend. His kindness is real. You'll like him. Dad. I see many similarities between you two. Indeed. Might become good pals. Do you think I could be friends with a man who knows he's dating a married woman? My wife. We could be drinking buddies, and I could let him borrow your mom on weekends. Was this your plan for me? Brandy slumped into a chair, realizing her method was flawed. My fury and style of speaking to her were new to her. She shrank from my fury, chilling. After walking around, I cooled down, faced my daughter, and spoke in a caustic voice she didn't want to hear. She felt insignificant and responsible for everything because of my pain. Listen carefully, Brandy. I want you gone. I need privacy to understand your actions tonight. I don't want you around. Avoid calling me. Stop writing. Never. Your treachery is unacceptable. I have no daughter now. You're dead to me. Do you understand? You no longer call me father. I have no daughter. Please leave my home and never contact me again. Brandy wailed, covering her face in her hands. Please don't say that, Dad. I love you and want to stay tonight. My mother and I arranged my stay with you. Brandy, we don't want you alone. Your disdain makes me wonder if you ever respected or loved me as your father. I worked hard to give you and your mother a better life, and you are like your mother. I get this, thanks. It appears I've merely been a source of revenue and never earned your respect. Her weeping and wailing, she persisted. Father, I love you. Better not mention that. Leave it to mom. Let her explain tomorrow. You spent 30 lovely years with her and cherish her. Dad, give her one item and she won't leave. Loves you. She'll never have me again, whether she wants one, two, or a thousand things. I can't forgive. Everyone will be punished, including the man who seduced my wife alone. A married woman. Leave. Your actual self is revealed. Still have your mom. Nothing changes for you. You two are perfect together. Brandy, you're no longer my daughter in my heart. Leave now. She rushed out of the house, crying for the first time and feeling sorrow. She never expected her father's harsh response if he had abandoned her. She realized she may have overstepped in helping her mother with this plan for the first time. He loved them both, and she could see he was furious now more than ever. She fervently wished for his rapid forgiveness. After Brandy left, I called Maggie's cell and got her voicemail. I begged her to contact and return over and over. After a few drinks and no response, I sent several text messages repeating my request. I realized she wouldn't return by 2 a.m. and was ignoring my calls. Self-pity exhausted me, so I watched the TV, which was presenting more bad news. I felt like my life had become a nightmare. I contemplated our 30-year marriage. 
The birth of our daughter, celebrations, proms, Bree's marriage, and intimacy we had shared seemed lost forever. Even after Maggie's betrayal, we were intimate two, three times a week. It became routine and lost its appeal, but we never complained. We usually hugged and fell asleep after intercourse. No day or conversation went by without us expressing our affection. And conflicts were rare. I looked out the window to Maggie's art studio, which I built for her passion. She spent the previous twenty years creating wonderful paintings and sculptures. She won many awards for her art, which I displayed with her trophies. It became a sanctuary for my wife's skill and refuge. I always thought that studio was her favorite second to our baby. Maybe I was third in importance, but my love for her made everything okay, as long as she was happy. My chat with Brandy was profound. Her longing for another man was unexpected and unanticipated. I didn't notice her displeasure with me or our marriage during the years I worked long hours for my family. Her confiding in Brandy instead of telling me was demeaning and incited my rage, reflecting on life, home, and future. I remembered inheriting my grandfather's property without a mortgage before our marriage. I considered methods to hurt Maggie like she did today, fueled by my alcohol and rage. As I watched her studio, a malicious notion crossed my head. I felt energized from the couch, possibly from alcohol or the pain of betrayal and embarrassment before my child. I overcame sadness with commitment. I made many visits to our bedroom to move her items into the studio. Her expensive shoes, dresses, undergarments, jewelry, and everything else were scattered across her beloved art studio floor. I spent the next hour gathering all the photo albums, including our wedding photos, and adding them to the pile. I then found her wedding gown, baby clothes, and other treasures in the attic and added them to the mound, now over a meter tall. It's remarkable the quantity of belongings one accumulates over time. Next, I took all her photographs from the walls, adding them and all her adored belongings to the pile. It was already 5 a.m., and I was still restless. I decided to wait until 6 a.m., allowing her a final opportunity to return or respond to my messages. Should there be no reply or her absence? Continue. I resolved to proceed with my plan. I strolled through the house once more, ensuring that everything she cherished and took care of was in the studio. By 530, I took a 20-liter can of gasoline from the garage and headed to the studio, preparing for 6 a.m. During this period, I went online, canceled our shared credit cards, moved funds to our separate accounts, withdrew cash from the safe, and packed several suitcases. Then I loaded them into my truck because I needed to stay away from home until an attorney could resolve everything. After waiting an additional five minutes for her return and at 605, losing all hope, I doused the pile in the studio's walls with gasoline with a heavy heart. And after a brief moment of hesitation, I decided to throw a burning match onto the floor, which instantly set the pile ablaze. The fire spread rapidly, and before I could leave, flames were already visible from the street. The fire swiftly engulfed her possessions and everything she held dear as I drove on the highway. A sudden realization hit me, intensified by my dreadful condition. A profound sadness engulfed me and tears streaming down my cheeks. It was then I understood that my once joyful marriage had met the same end as the studio. It had been destroyed. Unexpectedly, the fire spread from the studio to the back porch, which also caught fire, including the art studio. Fortunately, the firefighters who extinguished the studio fire managed to put out the porch fire and save the house. The home suffered extensive smoke damage and was unlivable until the repairs were made. Amidst all this, I checked into a motel about 90 miles away from the remnants of what used to be my marriage and paid in cash. I wanted to remain undiscovered until I could think clearly, knowing that using credit cards could lead the police to me. I stayed awake, fueled by adrenaline, until I entered my room. I turned off my phone and fell onto the bed, plunging into a deep sleep, only waking at noon. As soon as I turned on my phone, I saw dozens of missed calls and messages from Brandy, Maggie, and the sheriff. After exiting the Uber, I met Alexander at the restaurant, feeling both anxious and thrilled to see this attractive young man waiting for me at the reception. He smiled upon seeing me dressed in a little black dress, black sheer tights, and matching high heels, his gaze drawn to my deliberately revealed cleavage, accented by my black bra. 
I had spent several hours at the salon earlier in the day getting my hair and makeup done to perfection. I aimed for this occasion to be thrilling, memorable, and perfect for him. My companion seemed impressed by my appearance, and the way he adjusted himself made his interest clear. My confidence soared, realizing he appreciated my look, and I greeted him with a soft kiss when he welcomed me. We began at the bar, sitting on the bar stools. As I stood up, I noticed his gaze following my legs, sheathed in nylon, down to my underwear. We both grinned as he placed our drink orders. I chose to turn off my cell phone, ensuring that nothing would disrupt the evening's enjoyment. She was aware that such a night would not recur, and she intended to savor every instant. There was a mutual attraction between us, making it feel as though we were long-time companions. I caught myself caressing his arm and engaging in playful banter. Actions not typical for me with others, including Jason. However, today I was ready to embrace my adventurous side and relish the experience as we concluded our second beverage. The cordial hostess informed us our table was prepared and guided us to our seats. The dinner was splendid, and I appreciated both the dialogue and the shared moments. Upon his inquiry about continuing the night together, I slipped off my shoes and slid my foot between his legs, observing my crimson toenails through the translucent fabric of my stockings. He grinned and suggested it was time to depart. Hand in hand, he escorted me to his prearranged hotel room as the elevator doors parted on the 14th floor. I contemplated my impending actions with fleeting thoughts of Jason. He seemed to sense my hesitation and drew me closer, raising my gaze to his. I was met with a passionate embrace, unparalleled by any before. This was sufficient to dispel thoughts of my spouse and vows. Once inside, he promptly began to undress me, and as my dress pulled at my feet, he followed suit. He complimented my allure, then gently removed my undergarments and positioned me on the bed. The duration is a blur— but the affection and tenderness felt led me to yearn for more. I devoted myself to admiring his physique, which he greatly appreciated. In a moment of arousal, he insisted I wear my heels again, finding them irresistibly appealing. This act added a hint of boldness to our intimacy. His kisses, frequent and skilled, prompted fleeting thoughts of teaching Jason. These techniques, such comparisons ceased as he gazed into my eyes. Confessing his love, his declaration was profoundly moving, evoking an emotional and almost spiritual reaction. Our connection deepened further, culminating in additional intimate encounters that night and once more in the morning, each as passionate as the last. This became the pinnacle of my sexual experiences, and I was content with my decision to indulge, waking to thoughts of Jason and the reality they invoked. I attempted to concentrate on the man beside me who embraced me warmly with the dawn's light filtering through the curtains. He kissed me softly, expressing his genuine feelings once more. Despite his affection and the unforgettable night, I gently reminded Alexander of my marital commitment, unable to entertain a repeat. Acknowledging the pleasure shared and his qualities as a partner, I nevertheless emphasized the singularity of our encounter. He urged me to reconsider promising happiness, yet I could only commit to contemplation. Our farewell was marked by another profound kiss, leaving me torn. If not for Jason, Alexander would be my choice. Yet my loyalty to my husband prevailed, coupled with a hope for his forgiveness. After breakfast, we departed from the hotel, and as he drove me home, I activated my phone for the first time since our outing. The previous evening, I was astonished to find numerous missed calls and messages. Seeing Jason's text, I experienced a twinge of remorse in my heart. This kind man was in distress, and I wasn't there. Tears welled up in my eyes, realizing that I was the cause of his sorrow. Then, before I could proceed to the next message, the phone rang just as Alexander was turning into my area. Mom, where are you? Hey, sweetheart. I'm nearly home, Mom. There was. There was a blaze at your place. We've been trying to reach you all night, but it looks like your phone was off. Blaze, where's your father? That's the issue, Mom. He's gone. No one knows his whereabouts, and he's not answering his calls either. I have a dreadful feeling, sweetheart. I'm almost there. I'll ring you back. As Alexander made the turn onto my street, I spotted a fire engine and police outside our home, noticing no visible harm to the front of the house. 
I inquired with the firefighters about the incident. Are you the proprietor of this residence? He queried, with all the neighbors eyeing me, standing alongside an unfamiliar yet attractive individual. My companion? Yes, I'm Maggie Spencer. Well, Mrs. Spencer, we managed to preserve the house. Only the rear deck suffered damage. However, I'm afraid it's not habitable until you've had professionals clear the smoke inside. The main destruction was to the small house at the back. Regrettably, it's entirely gone. I felt weak in the knees when Alexander supported me, allowing me to sit on the curb. My workshop. Is it harmed? Sorry, Mrs. Spencer, what remains is merely charred. Ruins will endeavor to uncover the fire's cause. But for now, the police detective would like to ask you a few queries. I hastily made my way to the rear of the house before Sergeant Wilson could address me. He caught up as I stood before the wreckage of what was my most cherished asset. Instantly, I assumed Jason must have set this fire in retaliation. Mrs. Spencer, do you have any knowledge of what transpired here? Sergeant Wilson inquired. No, I wasn't here last evening, and I'm clueless about everything. Are you her spouse? He questioned, turning to Alexander. No, merely a friend. I felt my cheeks flushed with mortification as the sergeant eyed me with a discerning gaze and inquired about my husband's location. I'm not sure, I replied when he queried about my whereabouts the previous night. I hesitantly mentioned being with Alexander at the Hilton in the downtown area. The scrutinizing looks from the sergeant and his aide made me comprehend the gravity of my predicament by confessing my absence alongside my husband, who was also missing. I had inadvertently implicated myself. The detective now had inquiries from Mrs. Spencer. Are you and your spouse estranged? Do you know his location last night? No, we're contentedly wed. Then I grasped how absurd my statement sounded after acknowledging my night with another man. Do you know his current location? No, he's unreachable. We'll need to speak with him. So when you contact him, could you pass along my details? He requested, offering his card. I was trembling with both rage and fear rage due to the loss of my sanctuary and all the labor I had poured into it over the years. Everything had vanished forever. Fear gripped me at the thought that Jason could be so filled with fury as to do this and what it implied for our marriage. I felt an urgent need to converse with him immediately. I phoned Brandy. Brandy, do you know where your dad is? No, I haven't spoken to him since last night. Why weren't you supposed to stay here with him? As we agreed, he kicked me out, declaring I was no longer his daughter. Hearing this, a cold wave swept over me. It was inconceivable that Jason would utter such words, and if he did, the reality must be far graver than I could envisage. Upon entering the house, I noted the walls damaged by smoke and was met with a horrendous odor that filled our dwelling, making it clear that residing here under such conditions was out of the question. I run through our house, resolving to gather clothes and a few personal items for several days. When I stepped into the bedroom, I was struck by panic as I noticed that everything was missing. I came to the horrifying realization that all my attire, footwear, and personal effects were gone. Despair engulfed me as I searched for my wedding rings on my nightstand, only to find them absent. And why did I leave my rings? What was going through my mind if Jason had seen them on my dresser? He surely must have concluded I had deserted him and our union. How thoughtless and self-centered of me. In sheer panic, I scoured every room in the house, only to discover that all my possessions were missing. A dreadful suspicion crossed my mind. Had he actually incinerated everything? Was there truly nothing left? I dashed out of the house back to the studio to inspect the remnants more closely. There, amidst the debris, I spotted picture frames and partially intact pieces of clothing. It was evident that Jason hadn't taken my absence lightly. Instead, he had obliterated everything of significance to me, effectively excising me from his life in one swift stroke. I phoned Brandy in tears, informing her of the catastrophe and my need for a place to stay. Alexander promptly offered his home, but he was the very last person I wished to encounter. I insisted on needing solitude and requested him to leave, which evidently pained him. Left alone. My tears flowed freely. In that moment, I felt resentment towards myself and the individual with whom I had spent the previous night. I recognized my error, yet I unfairly attributed my misdeed to him, though the fault was entirely mine. Brandy, 
I've lost your father. Mom, don't say such things. Dad adores you. He incinerated everything. My attire, my art, my workshop. He left me with nothing. Not even a shelter. He's unresponsive to my calls or messages. I've hurt him deeply and I bear no resentment. What I did is beyond. Pardon? I shouldn't have gone on that outing. I should have simply expressed my feelings to him. Perhaps then we could have mended things, but my egotism drove him away. If our roles were reversed, I doubt I could ever welcome him back. What am I to do now? I'm devoid of both a home and clothing. Mom, don't castigate yourself. The blame is also mine. You can stay us until your home is repaired. This afternoon we can shop for new attire and settle you in by evening. Brandy. All my art and sculptures are missing. Three decades of marriage and two decades of my life's work obliterated, leaving me in solitude. I've lost all reason to live. Maggie wept openly as neighbors observed from afar. My goodness, your father's on the phone. I'll call you back. Fumbling with the buttons in a desperate attempt to connect. She nearly fainted. Yet at the last moment, she succeeded in answering. Jason, is that you? Hello, Maggie, how are you? Jason, where are you? Please return home. We need to converse. No, Maggie, I'm aware of everything. Through your daughter? Yes, your daughter, not mine. You both are dead to me and this conversation might very be our last. Jason, please don't say that. I adore you. You must know this. Jason, the studio has disappeared. Was this your doing? Maggie, you are responsible, not me. Perhaps not directly. But it was destroyed by your deceit and disloyalty. When I discovered that our wedding rings were discarded, and you surrendered yourself to someone else in my heart, you were no longer alive. Your behavior is indefensible, and Bree's involvement is embarrassing and baffling. This is the end. I will consult with the attorneys on Monday to begin the proceedings. Please, Jason, can't we discuss this and find a solution? You can't simply discard our thirty beautiful years together like this. Maggie, we are having this conversation, and I am not the one discarding our thirty beautiful years. You decided to deceive me, showered me with two weeks of wonderful affection to soothe your guilt, and then you were unfaithful to me with your daughter's assistance. There is no one on this planet who could overlook or forgive such deceit and betrayal. It was utterly malicious. And I hope you regret your actions for the rest of your miserable life. This is our final conversation. You can reach me through my lawyer's details, which will be provided with the divorce papers. Goodbye, Maggie. Jason. No way. Jason. Jason. Jason was gone. And with him, the world I adored and held dear. Brandy arrived just as I was attempting to call Jason, who had already disconnected the call. We embraced shedding tears over what we had lost. Eventually, we recognized that we could not stay amidst the remnants of what used to be my home, while the fire and police conducted their investigations. We needed to sort things out. So we went to Barry's residence. Upon our arrival at her home, she laid out the entire situation to Mike, who was taken aback by her recount of the events. Brandy attempted to explain the whole story, but when Mike found out that his wife had arranged a meeting with her friend's dad, he was appalled and became enraged. Brandy, you organized a meeting with another man for your mother, and you were aware that your father would be left alone. You should have realized he wouldn't agree to it. What kind of man would permit his wife to meet with another? Is this your plan for our future? Will you shame me as your mother did to your father? He was an incredible person, and you and your mom meant everything to him. What have you done, Brandy? I'll tell you what you've done. You've ruined a decent man and driven him to do unspeakable things. I cannot convey how let down I am by you, Brandy. I will reach out to him and apologize for your foolishness. Once this is resolved, you and I need to have a serious talk about our future. The thought of having children with you is now paused until I fully grasp your principles. Let me be clear. I do not agree with them, and I will never accept such disloyalty. She was taken aback by his fury and astonished that he failed to grasp her mother's predicament. It was merely one date after thirty years of marriage, for heaven's sake. But later she came to understand that the real issue was the dissolution of her parents' marriage, the loss of her father, and the end of her mother's joyful existence. Soon, they would all face the repercussions of her decisions. Five days later, I went back to my home to evaluate the wreckage. I decided against filing an insurance claim to avoid any additional expenses on top of what I was already facing. 
During the meeting with the attorney, I clarified that the house was mine and would not be included in the divorce settlement. Maggie can have half of our savings and no alimony if she contests. I will press charges for infidelity and reveal to everyone how she was unfaithful to me with her daughter's friends. Dad, I've already seen a lawyer and initiated the divorce proceedings. Then I requested the name of a lawyer specializing in arson cases. However, after consulting with him, I realized that since the property was mine, criminal charges were unlikely unless I lodged an insurance claim, which I had no plans to do in a severe case. The fire department might impose a fine, but criminal charges would not be pursued through the courts unless a fraudulent claim was made. A neighbor who went to school with Brandy contacted her upon seeing me return and enter the house. Brandy quickly approached me while I was evaluating the damage and determining the necessary repairs to make the house habitable again. As I was inspecting the destruction, I glanced out the window at the remains of what used to be Maggie's secret spot and couldn't help but smile. When Brandy found me in one of the rooms, she rushed over and embraced me tightly. Daddy, I'm so sorry. Please forgive us. We love you, she pleaded. I responded coldly. Brandy, I'll never forgive either of you, and I've already instructed you never to speak to me again. Now let me be and leave me alone, she persisted. No, you're my father, and you have to forgive me. I'm your only daughter, and you adore me, I retorted. Listen, I no longer consider you my daughter. You're just a deceitful person who shattered my... You're not my daughter anymore. Please leave me alone, she continued. Dad, Mom needs you. She's living with us and misses you terribly. She's constantly crying and wants to make amends for her mistake, I firmly replied. I will never visit the moment she decided to spend that night away. Our marriage was finished. She even left her wedding rings on the table, signifying our marriage's end. It's done, and I refuse to communicate with her further. You and she can reach out to my attorney. I'm getting a new phone number today. But for now, you'd better stay with your unfaithful mother. Are you really willing to discard 30 years of marriage? She questioned. I clarified. No, it was your mother who discarded those 30 years the moment she removed those rings and left. It was both of you who destroyed my 30 years of joy, and for that, I can neither forgive nor forget. Now leave my house. Brandy exited her childhood home in tears for the second time, deeply wounded by her father, disowning her, a scar that no amount of therapy could heal. The following day, Maggie received the divorce documents and was overwhelmed realizing her marriage had ended due to her unfaithful action. She attempted reconciliation, sought counseling, and tried conversing with Jason all in vain. He ceased all communication with her and Brandy. Mike managed to confront Jason, expressing his outrage and disappointment at the actions of the women. He reconsidered his desire for children due to his views on Brandy's fidelity and her role in the war, doubting he could ever share his life with someone of that mindset. He's now in couples therapy, trying to salvage his marriage. Maggie wished to return to the house after Jason restored it, but the divorce decree declared the house, Jason's excluding it from the settlement. She was compelled to seek her own accommodation. The court granted her half of their savings and monthly child support of $3,000 for 10 years, which he didn't in to pay. Maggie was forced to secure employment and support herself for the first time in 30 years. She eventually relocated from her daughter's apartment to a modest studio near downtown, where she found a job at a small art gallery as a sales representative to make ends meet. Maggie's creative freedom was suddenly at risk. She would no longer be able to dedicate all her time in the lovely studio that Jason constructed for her. She would no longer have the chance to sit in front of her art projects and relish the stunning view of the lake through the expansive panoramic windows that her spouse provided her. Soon, she would be overwhelmed with work and would utilize all her spare time to make her life somewhat similar to before all her leisure time vanished, along with her privilege and joyful matrimony. All because of one thrilling night with another individual. She could never shed enough tears. She would forever lack the tears to wash away all the hurt and anguish her single encounter caused. No, her affectionate husband Jason would never talk to her again. Learning that he disowned their daughter left her heart in pieces. Brandy sunk into a severe depression due to her parents' marriage crumbling to deal with the sorrow and salvage her own marriage, which was also unraveling. She sought a psychotherapy harpist. A few months later, the residence was mended. Jason kept up with the court-ordered payments and unexpectedly sold the dwelling. 
One day after finalizing the sale, Maggie approached him to attempt reconciliation and request forgiveness. When she pressed the doorbell, a young duo welcomed her. Hello? How can we assist? The woman inquired. Yes, I am searching for Jason Spencer. Is he present? The kind man who sold us this dwelling. No, he mentioned he was leaving the nation to begin anew. He was so generous and so supportive. Are you by any chance, Maggie? Yes, it's me. He left an envelope and instructed us to hand it to you if you ever came by. Thank you. I'll read it later. Good fortune and cherish this magnificent home. Maggie sat in her vehicle, weeping, aware she would never encounter Jason again, mourning the love she had so negligently squandered. Back in her solitary apartment, she sat up in bed, her hands shaking as she unfolded the letter. Maggie, thirty wonderful years. I will eternally cherish the splendid life we shared. You were my initial and sole love, and I deeply regret not fulfilling my role as your spouse. Had I known you desired more, I would have moved heaven and earth for you. But since you've chosen to pursue your journey solo, this is how our marriage concludes alone. After two amazing weeks leading to your betrayal, I truly believed you had rediscovered your love for me. Those weeks were the most joyous in all the years we spent together. When Brandy revealed how you utilized those weeks to divert me from your betrayal, it shattered my spirit. I presume your daughter has informed you. But that evening I was so thrilled to return home to surprise you with a special evening, including two dozen roses, your preferred chocolates, and wine. I was planning to surprise you with a new cruise on our yacht, discovering that your love and admiration were insincere and your real intention was to be with another man. I felt disgraced. Congratulations. You've destroyed me in our marriage. As a result, I can't remain in this city. I resigned from my job and embarked on a new life abroad. Don't attempt to find me because I will be unreachable, and I genuinely have no desire to communicate with you or your daughter again. This chapter of my life is concluded and I will begin anew without you. It will take me years to heal from the pain and betrayal you both inflicted. There was no way I could stay in this beloved home without the love of my life and my amazing daughter as both are now dead to me. I have no reason to. Linda here. I genuinely hope that your special night was worth our marriage and my affection. I believe so. And I'm convinced you and your daughter will find joy in the tales you share. Have a joyful existence and kindly erase me and our years spent together from your memory. Just as I have already done, my new journey has begun without you. Upon reading his note, she was certain there were no tears left to shed. Yet she found herself weeping without end throughout the night, huddled up tightly. The thrill and memories of the wonderful moments with Alexander turned into faint recollections, now overshadowed by remorse and sorrow. At fifty-two and on her own, she realized her future without Jason looked grim. She had forsaken her comfortable lifestyle for a single night, a thoughtless thrill. Jason sought out Alexander in the dead of night as he was about to depart for his new residence in Ecuador when the door swung open. Jason barged into the home, introducing himself as the spouse of the woman Alexander had taken from him. Alexander attempted to clarify, suggesting he believed Maggie was indifferent to their affair and would not have engaged with her if he had any doubts. However, it was too late. Jason dismissed all his explanations, all the anger, fury, and agony he had endured over the recent months, now aimed at the man he deemed a usurper. Their exchange was brief. Jason, wielding a crowbar, changed Alexander's life, within moments before heading to his awaiting ride to the airport destined for Ecuador. Jason glanced at the pained man, advising, engaging with a married woman can severely damage your health. By the time Alexander reached the emergency department and recounted the incident to the police, Jason was en route to his new beachfront apartment in Manabe province, ready to start afresh, leaving behind his past and family. It took law enforcement officers a fortnight to ascertain Jason had left the country and they were powerless to pursue him abroad, since Ecuador does not extradite for assault charges. Alexander endured a grueling two weeks in the hospital, followed by extensive physical therapy to adapt to his new knees. Regrettably, the 25 stitches scarring his face would forever remind him of that night. Unsure of what lay ahead, he was certain the life he once knew. It ended all because of the two women who urged him to take another spouse. He never again contacted Maggie or Brandy. Brandy's marriage to Mike was nearly destroyed by the ordeal. 
but with a psychologist's assistance, Brandy came to grasp her actions and vowed to stay true to Mike and their envisioned future together. Mike waited two years before deciding to have children to reassure himself that his wife would never deceive him as she had deceived her father. True to his promise and her regret, Jason never communicated with Brandy again. Through her actions, she irrevocably spurned her father and his affection. Upon hearing about Alexander's assault, Maggie and Brandy were heartbroken and felt accountable for the attack, intensifying their guilt and sorrow for causing Jason pain and for shattering their family. It served as another indication that their deeds had far-reaching effects they hadn't anticipated. Both acknowledged that their misguided belief that if only Jason had agreed to Maggie's request once their joyous life would have persisted was incorrect. Their foolishness confirmed that a blissful existence was now completely out of reach. The absence of their father and husband inflicted an anguish on them, a torment they would endure for the rest of their lives due to depression and aging. She never met another partner and led a solitary, melancholic existence. All her dreams of a joyful old age with Jason and their grandchildren turned into a faint recollection. Since Jason ceased providing child support upon leaving the country, her savings dwindled rapidly, forcing her to keep working to make ends meet. Weeping in her dreams turned into her regular routine. I now possess over three quarters of one million dollars from selling my home and the savings I accumulated over the last 30 years. After deducting the cost of my new flat with this sum, I can afford a comfortable and peaceful life here in Ecuador for the next 30 years. Many young, attractive women here value the kind American man, and I relish their company. Six months following that dreadful evening, I found myself on the beach in Puerto Lopez, across from my new flat, enjoying a chilled beer and coming to the realization that divorce is commonplace. Separation is acceptable and solitude is fine. What's abnormal is remaining where one is not cherished. This mistake will not be repeated. Subscribe to our channel so you avoid the mistake of your partner being unfaithful. Thank you for taking the time to hear today's story. If you enjoyed the article, please like and subscribe if you have not already. If you have a story to offer about your own or someone else's situation, please do not hesitate to contact me. Take care.